This is a standard stereo potentiometer, often used as a volume control. Now, this particular one is not of a particularly high quality, but it's used to demonstrate a point, basically. Most people, I think, would use something like an Alps pot, which are generally reckoned to be one of the better quality analog pots, for want of a better word. You can replace that with this, and this is basically the same thing. It's a digital volume control. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of circuitry involved to get the volume from zero to maximum. But ironically, if you compare the cost of this to an Alps pot on a printed circuit board, the price is virtually the same. So if you're constructing an amplifier, you have this choice. Do I go analog or do I go digital? The advantages of an analog potentiometer is size and ease of mounting and there are no power supplies required. It's, it's as simple as that. The disadvantages are the tracking between one side, one of the, the, of the channels than the other. And these typically have quite a wide variation. And they can be, I think the general spec is about plus and minus 2 dB, which is actually not, not that good. That becomes worse on a volume control, which uses a logarithmic taper. Um, it's just it's just a fact of life that l logarithmic pots don't generally track as well as a linear pot. You will also find that the lower the value of resistance, the more accurate the matching tends to be. Now, if you're in the valve brigade, many of the volume controls would be 500k, maybe up to one meg, and the the chances of those matching on a low cost pot like this is pretty slim. And one of the biggest issues is where you start. Now, if the mismatch is towards the middle or at higher levels, surprisingly, you don't notice it. But what you will notice is when you first turn the volume on from nothing, one channel will often start before the other channel and then it sticks out like a sore thumb. Less prominent with a decent quality pot. Oh look at this, there's a rabbit outside. Can you see that? <laughs> I just saw it out the corner of my eye, sitting there like it owns the place. <laughs> Sorry about that, I digress. I think I'll have to pull the curtain so I'm not at uh, sideswiped by what's going on outside in the garden. Anyway, where were we? The digital version. This works, as the name implies, in the digi digital domain. With the analog potentiometer, it's virtually impossible to overload the input of the amplifier. There are no active components to overload. And of course the analog pot introduces no distortion. Whereas the digital pot may do. And that's what the purpose of this video, after all this time of showing you the rabbit and beating about the bush, we're going to do some tests and see if it suffers from, um, the only thing that it will suffer from instantly, which really bugs me. If, that's, if this was an analog pot, you go like that and that would be full volume from zero. Whereas this one, you're probably gonna to have to wind it up like it's a clock to get from zero to high level. And that's my initial thing that I don't like about it. This is the main control board and is simply in and out. And you have two phonos or RCAs if you prefer and you also have an input of a 3.5 millimeter stereo socket and the same 
for the output. The input is on this plug here and is a pretty standard one and you could also apply power here. There's no plug or socket provided but you can solder the, light, the, the cables directly to it. The main active components on here are there's a diode here which is reverse polarity protection. Now this one I can't identify but I suspect it's a regulator. This is the main operating chip which is a PT2259S. This is our audible test setup and I'm feeding it at the moment from this 12 volt battery simply because it's easy and it, I know that I'm not going to introduce any noise from anything else so we will literally find out what the noise is like this. The input is coming from the computer at the moment through this preamp and it goes in here and comes out here and then it's fed to my main power amplifier and through a pair of loudspeakers. I have at the moment the volume here on maximum and I've got it set on the preamp so it's just comfortable listening level and I'm going to turn the volume down and you'll see how many turns you have to turn it to actually get the volume to go off. So we'll put the song on. So how many turns is that? It's a lot, isn't it, to, to just basically turn it down. The maximum you can actually feed into it and get the same out without distortion is about 1.2 volts. So that may not be enough if you've got a fairly insensitive amplifier. So if you're going to have a preamp, the preamp needs to be after the volume control so you get the gain you want. Now, I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I'm showing you the scope at the moment because that's the clean signal with 1.2 volts coming out and going in. So I'm going to increase the level now and look at the waveform, what happens. All of a sudden, it goes completely into high distortion and if I turn it down a bit that is 10% distortion providing you keep the levels below 1.2 volts which is about here in fact it's exactly there it's pretty good channel matching is absolutely superb if you look at the meter there you see it's on the 0 db i'm going to swap the leads over and that's the other channel certainly on the monitor here i can't see any difference at all its frequency response well i stopped at 100k it's completely flat past 100k i got bored after 100k insofar as who cares it's not 1 dB down it's flat to 100k the low end is slightly less than perfect it's completely flat at 30 Hertz at the lowest end completely flat all the way through the spectrum and it's 1 dB down at 5 Hertz well, what do they say in the world? Nothing's perfect. And this is what's not perfect about this. The blue trace is the input and the yellow trace is the output. This is 20 kilohertz. And as you can see, it rings like a bell. Overshoot and then starts to ring. Now, for those of you that are saying, oh, that's 20 kilohertz, that's not a bad square wave. Well, there's nothing wrong with the square wave except it rings and overshoots. 
Well, here we are with 10 kilohertz. It seems to be less prominent at lower frequencies, but if we expand it a bit, you can see that's it's really ringing, isn't it? The bells, the bells. So for that alone, I can't recommend this because there shouldn't be any ringing at all on a square wave. I think it's actually oscillating. It sure looks like it, doesn't it? When you increase, let's take the gain down to zero. I don't know whether that's oscillation or noise. Sure looks like oscillation, doesn't it? One point four megahertz. Hmm. Maybe that's the clock frequency of the um, controller. Surely you're not going to hear that. And it's well buried within the noise. Let's just take the gain down a bit. But then you get to a certain point there when it really starts to ring. Now, in the dustbin, along with all the other junk. Small wonder you were having trouble. The machine, sir, is foreign. Well, to sum up, what a disappointment. Everything about it is good, apart from the fact it seems to be oscillating or unstable. I've tried taking wires out, earthing it at different points. Um, surprising that it's oscillating, considering it's got no gain. I really, really wanted this to be good. And how it's going to sound I don't know at this stage. In fact, that will probably manifest itself as tizziness on the high frequencies. But because I've measured it, you, you know from experience what certain visual displays look like. Um, I should say what they sound like. And I don't think I'd want this on the on the front of my L12 or L15. I think I'll stick to the conventional volume pot, even though the matching of it may not be as good. Yeah, I think that's all I can say about it. Thank you for watching.